Hey, fourth graders. Welcome back. Tried to save you from some of my chewing, but as I was eating this apple and I'm planning out my lunch with this classic crust pizza, I was thinking about what we're reading today and I thought I would share it with you. So let's go ahead and hop into these slides and you'll figure out how an apple, pizza, and volcanic eruptions all go together. So let's share my screen and I'm gonna set my apple down. Give me one second. All right, we are on lesson two of anatomy of a volcanic eruption. And today we are learning to draw inferences just like we did in our last lesson from the text and the visuals. So we're adding in, we gotta look at those visuals to develop our understanding of the text. So we know we are successful today when we can define what is an inference, hopefully you're getting that, refer back to the details in the text and the visuals in the text for clues, and then make an inference. So again, let's review what is an inference. What's that first thing you need, fourth graders? You got it. You gotta go back in the text and find those details. Then what do you use? Hmm. Yeah, you're right. You gotta use what's in that brain or that fancy word schema. Then you have yourself an inference. Great job. So that's that first success criteria. You know what an inference is. Now, for our foundational skill today, we're gonna move on and just look at a few more prefixes. Remember, they come at the beginning of a word and they're from Greek. So the first prefix we're working with is amphi, amphi, right? Which means to, both, or on both sides. So amphi Pacific. So we're gonna look at this ring of fire that we've already learned about. So it says, it's, oh, where, why is the word amphipacific used to describe the location of the ring of fire? Well, if you think about it, that prefix tells us it's on both sides. So the ring of fire is on both sides of the Pacific Ocean. So that is why it's called that. All right, another prefix that we're working with today is anti. So that prefix means you're against it. Is there anything that you're against? Yeah, hopefully you're anti-bullying, right? That means you're against bullying. So use the meaning of the prefix and the base word. What is the meaning for anti-bullying? I just kind of told you, it means you're against it. You're against bullying. All right, so for your foundational skill today, it's a lot like last lesson, you're gonna try and pick from the word bank and see which sentence um, the word fits in where it makes sense. So take your time. Um, if you need to look words up, that's totally okay. You're using your resources and that's a great thing that readers do. So you have two different slides with that. Now we're on to vocabulary. So what is this word? Hmm. Uh, Collide. Oh, it's collide. So when two plates collide, the denser one moves underneath the lighter one. And then you got a picture of two cars colliding. So what does that mean? Hopefully you figured out it means to hit something or each other with strong force. Good job, fourth graders. Now what about this word? Divergent. Divergent. So we're gonna read about divergent plate boundaries today, but there's a picture here that kind of gives it away. It says one divergent plate boundary is found under the Atlantic Ocean. This is where the North American plate and Eur Eurasian plate are pulling apart. So they're pulling apart here. So what do you think divergent means? Good job, it means you're pulling in opposite directions. You got this. All right, so we're gonna start reading together today. Let me get my arrow. And we are starting with a volatile planet. Earth and its many layers. The Earth we can see is a rocky planet covered by vast oceans and plants. That, however, is just the visible part of Earth. The planet is made of layers which vary in thickness and makeup. Crust. The top layer of Earth is called the crust. Earth's crust is made of solid rock. The crust is Earth's thinnest layer. It carries, it varies in thickness depending upon location. 
On the continents, the crust ranges between 19 and 37 miles in thickness, or 31 and 60 kilometers. The crust underneath the ocean can be as thin as three to six miles, five to 10 kilometers. Earth's crust is made of large pieces called plates. These plates fit together like a giant jigsaw puzzle. So if we look over here, it's pointing to, right here is the crust, this outer layer, and it looks pretty thin like they were saying. Then over here, it says the mantle. The mantle is the layer directly beneath the crust. So let's look at it. Oop, it's this little orange layer right here. So this layer is about 1,800 miles or 2,900 kilometers thick. The mantle makes up 84% of the volume of Earth's interior. The upper part of the mantle is made of partially melted rock called magma. The rocks and magma in the mantle move in circular patterns when they are heated and cooled. These movements are called convection currents. So down here, it tells us what that means. It's a circular motion in a liquid caused by heating and cooling. Now let's go learn about the core. The core is divided into an outer core and an inner core. The outer core is liquid, the inner core is solid. The tremendous amount of pressure in the inner core squeezes the atoms together to form a dense solid material. So let's look at that. We've got the inner core here and the outer core. Uh, the core is about 2,174 miles thick. So if we look, let's compare them. This is three to six miles. The mantle is 1,800 1, miles. And then the core is 2,175 miles. So which one is the biggest? Yeah, it would be the core, right? So scientists can't cut into Earth to find out what it looks like on the inside. One way they can learn about Earth's interior is by studying seismic waves. These are waves that occur during earthquakes. And hopefully you made a connection. We've already learned a little bit about those. Uh, really quick, did you see my connection between my apple and my pizza? This apple also has a core in the middle, just like the earth. And my pizza crust has a crust on the outside, just like the earth. Crazy. I thought it was cool. All right, let's keep reading. Where plates meet. Oh, and I guess we haven't read about that, fourth graders. I was just giving you a little sneak peek into the ring of fire over here. The plates that make up Earth's crust float on top of the mantle, like ships at sea. The plates move because the mantle's rocks are constantly in motion. They don't move quickly, but they move enough to cause changes in Earth's surface over time. Some plates move towards each other. These are called convergent plates when they move together. Convergent plates. When two plates collide, the denser one moves underneath the lighter one. So if we look at this picture, we can kind of see what's happening. This one kind of moves under and this one's moving on top. That's what happens when an ocean plate collides with a continental plate. The oceanic plate goes underneath the continental plate. The earthquakes are common at Earthquakes are common at these plate boundaries because of the stress created by the collision. The solid rock of the oceanic floor partially melts into magma as it moves deeper into the mantle. This magma is pushed up into the continental plate and forms a volcano. Whoa, that's so weird. So it's those solid rocks partially melts into magma as it moves deeper into the mantle. This magma pushes up into the plates and forms a volcano. Many volcanoes are found along the convergent plate boundaries. So cool. So let's learn about that ring of fire. The ring of fire is one of the most famous convergent plate boundaries on Earth. It's found in the Pacific Ocean. It is where the Pacific Ocean plate meets with all of the continental plates surrounding it. This area is called the Ring of Fire because more than 450 volcanoes are found here. In fact, 75% of all the world's volcanoes on land are found in the Ring of Fire. That is crazy. So if we look at that again, it's going all the way around. Mount Fuji in Japan is part of the Ring of Fire. Wow, that was a cool page. 
Okay, so let's look at this page. Where plates pull apart? So we kind of already talked about this. Some adjacent plates do not move towards each other. Instead, they pull away from each other. These are called divergent plates. Divergent plates. When two plates pull apart, they leave a space between them. This space is quickly filled with magma. It creates a new area of land called a ridge. So it kind of shows here that magma slipping up, filling in that space. If the magma pushes its way completely out of the ridge, undersea volcanoes are formed. These volcanoes keep growing taller and taller until their tops are out of the water. These new land formations become islands and island chains. How cool is that? Divergent plate boundaries. One divergent plate boundary is found under the Atlantic Ocean. This is where the North American plate and the Eurasian plate are pulling apart. Scientists believe that long ago, North America and Europe were connected, but after pulling apart for millions of years, they are now separated by a vast ocean. The plates are still moving apart today. The area where the sea floor is spreading is called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Down at the bottom here, it says many volcanoes are found along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. The island of Iceland, Iceland contains at least eight volcanoes. E is the volcano that caused all the disruption in the air travel in 2010. It is found on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge in Iceland. All right, and then if we look at that picture, because remember, we're also focusing on the pictures today. It's got the divergent plates moving apart. We've got that magma coming up to fill it in. Hot spots. Volcanoes occur where two plates meet. Sometimes they also form in the middle of plates in areas called hot spots. A hot spot is a place where magma rises up through the crust and forms a volcano. If a hot spot in the ocean the volcano will eventually grow tall enough to become an island. Over time, a different part of crust will move over a hot spot because Earth's plates are constantly moving. Then a new volcano forms. The most famous example of a hot spot is the Hawaiian island chain. Kauai was the island was the first island to form over the hot spot. As the crust moved to the northwest. And again, Miss Lawson doesn't know all these words always, but their names, so it doesn't always change the meaning. So I'm sure it's Kauai, maybe. Um, as the crust moved to the northwest, each additional island was formed. It's Kauai, just like Hawaii, silly Miss Lawson. Okay, so currently Hawaii Island is over the hot spot. It is one of the two Hawaiian islands with active volcanoes. Eventually, Hawaii Islands will move off the hot spot. Another volcano is rising far beneath the surface of the ocean. It is called Lohi, 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 and it is located about 19 miles southeast of Hawaii Island. Oh my goodness, they're tricking me today. K or Kilaui, Kilaui volcano. Sorry guys, I should be better at this. Hot spots don't move, don't just occur on oceanic plates. They can also occur on continental plates. Scientists believe a hot spot is what caused the volcanic activity in Yellowstone National Park. Kind of crazy. The Hawaiian Islands are volcanic islands that formed over a hot spot. And here are our islands that we're talking about. Okay, so which visuals helped you to gain new understanding from the text? And what were those understandings? So what I want you to do is to look back in that text. I'm gonna do a quick scan through and you can pause the video on the visuals that you think helped you the most. And then you're gonna figure out how did they help you? So we read a lot today. So which visual stuck out to you and helped you the most? I'm not gonna answer this question with you guys because it's kind of what you think. So we're gonna keep on moving. Visuals present information, captions, Boxed text, labels, and map keys are all parts of the visual. So if we look back, are there any visuals on this page? Actually, yeah. These boxes right here are part of this visual because it's describing each layer of the earth. 
So in this box down here with that information, it is also part of the visual because it's describing what is happening up here. Okay, so why are some of Earth's layers easy to study and why are some more difficult? Take some time to look back at these pages and figure it out. So hopefully you were looking back at those visuals because down here there was kind of a clue. It says scientists can't cut into Earth to find out what it looks like on the inside. One way they can learn about Earth's interiors by studying the seismic waves. So why can we learn a lot, or which layer do you think we can learn a lot about? Which one's on the outside? Yeah, this crust. The crust is the easiest layer to learn about because we live on the crust. What do you think is the hardest layer to learn about? It would probably be the core, right? Because it's way in there, so we don't have access to it. Now, how do earthquakes help scientists understand the Earth structure? So look back for details in the text and figure out what can you infer? Why do earthquakes help them figure out about the Earth? Hopefully you pause that video, but again, we're looking back down here. It says, by studying the Earth's interior is those seismic waves. Seismic waves go along with earthquakes. Um, so you can kind of see what it's doing to the rest of the Earth um, by checking out those seismic waves that go along with the earthquakes. Good job, fourth graders. Now it's time for you to try to make your inferences. So how does learning about the Earth's layers help you understand earthquakes, and volcanoes. Now you know all about the core, the mantle, and the crust. How does that knowledge help you understand earthquakes and volcanoes? So take your time. You got this. I believe in you. Have a great rest of your day, fourth graders. Thanks for coming. Bye.